A 13-year-old boy was reported as missing by his mother on Friday the 14th of September 2012. He was known to be a runaway, often leaving his house and staying with friends or wandering the streets until he decided to return home. But his mother was worried. Antonio Barbao was only 13 years old and no matter what kind of trouble he'd gotten into in the past, there was no telling where he was at now and how vulnerable he might be. What no one knew at the time was that Antonio was safe. He was at his great-grandmother's house just across town, but his grandma Barb, as he called her, was in much greater danger. And the truth of her final moments was more chilling than anyone could ever have imagined. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This show is made from various source documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents and so the episodes are accurate to the source material I can find. You can find all episodes as a podcast version listed in the show notes. Barbara Jean Shipman was born in July 1934 in Wisconsin. She grew up with two sisters who she was close to, and after she graduated, she married a man called Wesley Olson, and they ended up having a son, Stephen, and two daughters, Joy and Judy. Barbara was a big family woman and spent as much of her spare time as she could with her large family. By 2012, she had eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and she would spend her spare time tracing her ancestors and making family trees. Her husband, Wesley, was unfortunately suffering from Alzheimer's, and so he was living in a care home, and Barbara lived on her own. It was a Tuesday, September the 18th, 2012, that Judy was waiting patiently for her mother, Barbara Olson, to show up, just like she did most mornings. But on this Tuesday, Judy was beginning to become concerned when by mid-morning, she hadn't seen or heard from Barbara. She picked up the phone and called her mother, but no one answered. She waited a few minutes, all the time becoming more worried about what the reason could possibly be for her mother just not turning up. But when she tried to call again, the phone just rang out. This was completely out of character. And so Judy decided to head over to the house, which was just a few minutes drive away. When she arrived, she opened up the garage door and headed inside. Before she even got to the door that led to the actual house, she noticed that Barbara's car wasn't there. So it was likely that at this point, the assumption was that her mum had simply gone out. But, of course, this behaviour was odd, given that her mum hadn't let her know and was always calling to update her and let her know what she was doing that day. Before Judy could open the door to the house, something caught her eye. Lying on the floor, covered by a blanket, was someone lying down on the floor. It became clear pretty much straight away that the person lying on the floor was Judy's mother, Barbara and she could see that there was a lot of blood. What wasn't clear was what had actually happened, or the state of her mother's health. Judy grabbed the phone and frantically dialed 911. By this point, a neighbour was also in the garage with Judy and was standing by her side while she spoke to the operator. Oh, please send an ambulance from the police. My mother is laying in the garage and there's a lot of blood and there's a blanket over her head. There's how a lot of blood. The, how did the towel, how did the blanket get over her? I have no idea. And how old is your mother? She is um, 78. And is she breathing? I don't know. I can't look. Okay, the blanket is over her head and I can't look. Okay, can, who's here with you? Oh, God, the neighbor. Okay, can the neighbor check if she's breathing? Oh, you don't I have to go and look. You don't have to call. Or if you your neighbor can to. just go and check if she's breathing. Okay. They would like it. The investigation progressed quickly and it was immediately listed as a murder. The investigating team searched the areas close by to the house and the CCTV showed two young boys nearby. And when the officers spoke to the boys, what they would eventually reveal was chilling. Detectives brought 13-year-old Antonio Barbeau into the police station. They managed to get him in because at this point he was classed as a runaway and social services had been looking for him for the past few days. In Antonio's own words, in his interrogation, a warrant was out for his arrest and so it wasn't surprising to him when the police picked him up. Although, as far as Antonio was aware, it was all because of social services. Of course, the person questioning him asks straight away if he knows what's happened to his grandma, Barb, as he calls her. Antonio says no, and then asks what has happened. The detective slightly dodges this question at first, instead asking when the last time was that he saw her. 
and Antonio replies that it was at least a month ago and he hasn't seen her since. The detective gets more specific, asking when he was last at her house, to which Antonio says, maybe two months ago when he went to work for her, clearing up some leaves in the garage. When asked where he was at the weekend, he gets vague, simply replying that he was probably staying at a friend's house that Sunday night just gone by, but he couldn't remember fully or be specific, which the officer's questioning obviously found odd. The detective pushes, asking which friend specifically that he stayed with, and Antonio eventually says it was probably his pal Nathan. The Nathan he was talking about was 13-year-old Nathan Parp, and detectives already knew this. They had arrived at Nathan's house the previous day and asked to speak with him inside the house. His mother stayed close by, and the detective asked him questions for the following hour. One of the questions the detective asked was when Nathan had last seen his friend, the other boy identified on CCTV footage, Antonio. And Nathan replied saying that it was yesterday, just on the street near his house, and he'd seen him over the weekend and on Monday as well. And he added that Antonio had some issues with a friend of theirs because he'd broken into his house four times and stolen various different things. But soon after that, Nathan admits that he was also there and involved in the break-ins. The two boys were no stranger to breaking the law and getting into trouble together. It became obvious very early on that they sort of spurred each other on. And then the detective goes on to ask if he can take pictures of Nathan's shoes, to which he agrees. Those prints would eventually be taken on to try and compare with shoe prints that had been found at the crime scene. But the detective isn't finished there. He pushes Nathan, saying that he shouldn't try and cover up for his friend and they need to know the truth. Now, she's not super specific here, but she brings up previous dealings with illegal activities that Nathan and Antonio have done together. And that is when Nathan cracks. He then turns to the officer and asks if he can write it down. He clearly doesn't want to say what he's about to say or admit to out loud. The officer agrees, gives Nathan a pen, and then Nathan writes down, quote, he killed his grandma and I was with him. In the audio, you can hear Nathan crying while the detective explains that they then need to read him his Miranda rights. Can I understand with what you wrote down? She's very scared. Yeah. And because you wrote that down, Nate, I want to be able to read Miranda rights to you. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Thing that you have these rights, are you now willing to answer questions or make a statement? Yeah. I know you wrote that down and maybe you wrote it down because you didn't want her to, to, yeah. hear, to hear that. Is that why you wrote that down? Okay. After that, Nathan has no choice but to fully explain what happened. By his account, Nathan and Antonio were talking, saying that they needed some way to get some money, and that's when Antonio said he knew exactly how to get money, and then suggested killing his grandma Barb. Nathan is clear at this point that he did not think Antonio was being serious, and that this was all some kind of joke, and it very much fit with Antonio's character to make this kind of a joke. But after that, Nathan had asked his mum if they could grab a ride to nearby where Barbara lived, and at this point they tell the mum that they are just going to meet up with some friends. And so Nathan's mum agrees to take them, and she drives them to that area, drops them off at the side of the road, and this area is beautiful, it's tree-lined streets of West Wind Bluffs. At this point, Antonio has no idea that Nathan has already been questioned, and what he's admitted to, and so Antonio admits that sometime on Sunday, he and Nathan had taken Nathan's mum's car and they'd driven around the block. And remember that the boys are both just 13 years old. I know it's different in the US and you've got automatic cars, but I can't imagine even trying to drive a car at 13. Anyway, the officer then pushes him and brings up the fact that he's been spotted near to his grandma Barb's house and asks him to explain this but he says he simply can't. When the officer informs Antonio that his grandma has been killed, Antonio doesn't really show any emotion. And in fact, he goes on to say that he wasn't even that close to her. 
but being given this information, he doesn't actually ask anything about how his grandma Barb was killed or exactly what happened. Antonio is told by the officers that they have his grandma Barb's car and they need to know when he was last in that car. The forensics will tell them, they just want to hear it from him. But Antonio says that he hasn't been in that car for four or five months. And he continues being evasive to all of the questions asked. But when he is asked specifically when he was last at Theo's Pizza, which is where they've got CCTV footage for, Antonio then admits that he was there just a few days ago. And he says probably around lunchtime on Tuesday, adding that he went with Nathan and that they were only there because they found $20 on the floor of Nathan's house and used that to pay. But the more information Antonio gave, the more the detective questioning him lets on that they do know what happened and eventually that Nathan had given them the details. And that is when Antonio finally admits that the pair went to Grandma Barb's on Monday, just one day before her body was found. The following account is the most likely version of events based on both the boys' statements and the mountains of physical evidence that were found at the crime scene. The two boys had been dropped off around two miles walk from the house, from Grandma Barb's house. They had walked over there and then they found that the garage door was left open. Both of the boys then tried to use plastic bags to put over their faces to disguise themselves, but on doing this they realised that they couldn't see anything and so they took them off. Grandma Barb must have heard a noise or at least something that brought her attention to the boys standing in her garage and just as Antonio was about to open the door from the garage to the house, Barbara opened it and found Antonio on the other side. It's dark and so she asked who it was and then realised it was her great grandson but at this point Antonio still tries to cover his tracks and says it's not him. This boy is 13 but is he stupid? She's already recognised him. So anyway she asks him the question again and he still decided to lie and say no it wasn't him even though it's blatantly obvious that it is. But what Barbara hadn't seen at this point was that Antonio is hiding a weapon behind his back. And at the same time as all of this conversation is going on, Nathan is standing behind the door, but he stood on something that made a noise. And so Barbara turned around and saw him. And she then asked why they were in the garage. She asked if it was because they wanted to come out of the cold outside. So rather than being suspicious of them, she's just concerned for them. Remember that family mean everything to this woman. She's well aware of the troubles that Antonio has been getting into, but her first thought isn't suspicion, it is care. And so on that track, she then invites them inside. And as Antonio walks into the main section of the house, he pulls that axe that he'd hidden behind his back up underneath his sweatshirt. But as he did this, Barbara turns to him and tells him that she's going to call his mum. She knew that he was a runaway and that the authorities were out looking for him. And of course, when she says this, Antonio knows he doesn't want this to happen. And so that is, he says, when he decides to attack her. But we know from the evidence that this wasn't a spur of the moment attack. As he was trying to make out through this interview that it was just something that happened... We know that's not true. We know he and Nathan had intentionally gone to Grandma Barb's house. We know that they were armed. Nathan had brought a hammer and Antonio had brought an axe. It is very clear that they had planned this. So then in the interview, Antonio admits that he did hit Barb when he was inside the house. He said that he used the axe twice to do this, running for about 30 seconds before he quickly went to the bathroom because he felt unwell. But Barbara's post-mortem would later show that she was hit 27 times and she suffered both sharp and blunt force trauma, which indicates to both Nathan and Antonio's weapons. Nathan said it was Antonio who hit Barb a number of times before asking, quote, Nate help. Nathan then walked over towards Barbara and then eventually did use the hammer to strike her. But Nathan swore to the detective that 
he only did this, he didn't want to, but he was just worried about what would happen to him if he didn't and that Antonio would turn on him. After that, Antonio started grabbing different belongings from the house and packing them up, things like necklaces, earrings, other items of jewellery. And then he attempted to pull his grandma's body through the living room and into the garage where the plan was to put her in the boot of her own car, drive to a nearby river or a lake and dump her body. But these two boys are just 13 years old. They're small. Even with both of them working together, there's just no way they would have had the strength to actually move her. And so after realising this, they attempted to use a blanket to place under her to sort of manoeuvre her body but it didn't work and so they placed the blanket over her body mainly her head and just left her there and that is how she was found the next day now after they've just left her body there they actually head back into the house they grab three sodas barbara's purse and then they head back into the garage get into the car drive out of the garage onto the street outside before closing the garage door and then continuing on to nearby Nathan's house where they parked the car outside of a church. And that's when the two boys went into Nathan's house, counted the money in Barbara's purse and realised that they had just killed a woman for $155. The following day, the pair got back into Barbara's car and this time they drove over to Theo's Pizza, which is where the CCTV footage that the police had found, that's where that had come from. They sit there, they eat these two pizzas and then eventually they head out to a local supermarket. And the reason they headed to the supermarket was to buy gloves to wipe the car down And both Nathan and Antonio admit this. They say that it was to make sure that their fingerprints were completely gone from the car. There's a lot of thinking and trying to cover up this crime after it's happened. Throughout the confession, Nathan is adamant that Antonio forced him to take the hammer, hold it, and he also pushes the narrative that he was just a bystander and only took part in the crimes because he was worried about what Antonio might do to him. But the forensic evidence and part of what Nathan himself admits to puts him as an active participant in this crime. Killingly, the only question Antonio has by the end of the interview is, quote, how much time am I looking at? Obviously, the officer can't give him specifics, but the question in itself speaks volumes to how little he understands about what he's done. He even asked if he's still going to be going to the hearing for his running away from home and the decision on where he will be placed by social services. The officer then clarifies that he will not be leaving today and he even asks Antonio specifically, do you understand what you're going to be charged with? To which Antonio simply states, murder. The beating was so savage that Nathan described seeing the whole top of her head being quote gone and they had also wrapped Nathan's belt around the bag on her head to try and stop the blood from going everywhere but that obviously didn't really work and so they just left it there before they went back into the house to gather the other things. Antonio and his family say that this all came after he had a change in personality when he was run over on his bike and he had a brain injury. We see this happen quite a lot. We saw in the case on the Patreon podcast about Johnny Lewis, who uh, was an actor whose entire personality changed after he was involved in a motorbike accident. And he actually ended up killing his landlord before dying himself by jumping or falling off of a building. But in this case, there's no specific evidence that this is what happened in terms of a brain injury, other than Antonio and his family's suspicions. At trial, both the boys were charged as adults and more of the horrific details came out. Antonio's trial never actually went ahead though because he changed his plea from not guilty to no contest as part of a uh, plea deal. Nathan's trial, however, did go ahead. Nathan's defence painted him as a bystander, which isn't entirely surprising and Antonio was even called to the witness stand and spoke about how involved Nathan really was. Nathan later spoke about how at one point during the murder 
Antonio had taken off his sweatshirt so that it wouldn't get in the way of him swinging and so he could have a more effective attack. Antonio's grandmother, so the daughter of Grandma Barb, said that her mother wouldn't want Antonio to receive a strict punishment and so that he would have the chance to be a better person. But ultimately, Antonio was found guilty of first degree intentional homicide and life in prison was given to him with the possibility of parole after 36 years. And Nathan was found guilty of the same charge and sentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole in 31 years. Thank you for watching or listening to this episode of Red Rum. I appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have case suggestions, crack them down below. I will see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.